Well, I just found that I passed 15,000 subscribers. That's, uh, that's fantastic. And I just want to say thank you to you, all you all who uh, sit here, uh, watch the videos. It just, I mean, it's, it's nuts. The idea that, uh, you know, you don't know who I am. I don't know who you are, but that you've taken the time out of your you know, day. Your day consists of 24 hours. That's it. And you've taken some of that time to share with me uh, just about my uh, yapping, rambling about uh, financial planning and other things. That's uh, it's humbling. I, I don't know what else to say, but thank you. That's uh, it's amazing to me. Uh, much appreciated. Um, believe it or not, I get paid. I mean, YouTube is paying. Again, not huge amounts of money yet, but uh, and I don't expect it will ever pay huge amounts of money, but certainly it pays something, and, uh, and it's helpful. I mean, I just think about it. A year ago, uh, last month, I started the YouTube channel with no subscribers, no uh, videos, um, no views, I should say, and I followed the Miles Beckler 90-day uh, challenge where you do a video every day for 90 days. And, uh, and I actually found I liked it a lot, actually. So I started doing more than one a day, and I kept doing them and doing them and doing them because there's just so much stuff to talk about. Uh, the only people who don't have stuff to talk about on the financial advisory side are, uh, are people who aren't really into the business as it is because there's just tons of stuff to talk about, tons of research that comes out, tons of articles, a lot of stuff the uh, the mainstream financial pornography business uh, which is what it is, just regurgitating other things that were, uh, you know, clickbait. Oh, Social Security, or oh, we're all going to die, and that kind of stuff. I mean, literally, if you go back and read Wall Street Journal headlines, CNN headlines, all that stuff from 10 years ago, five years ago, it's, literally, it's the same thing. It's nuts, and you're just like, okay. So I don't really focus too much on that other than to kind of mock it a little bit. But the, the academic research is, uh, is forever changing, and the academic research is why we have the financial planning a pedigree that we have now relative to just being stock pickers and then mutual fund salesmen, which is cool. But uh, so thank you. I much, I'm much i just uh, grateful for you all to be here. I guess I'll take a time, though, because I'm sure there's lots of you all who don't know me and uh, that, you know, because I do so many videos, uh, over a thousand, I think it was almost 1,100 at this point. Uh, no way you could watch all my videos. Like, hey, if you do, that's great. Uh, so I'll just take a time, just introduce myself a little bit, I suppose. Um, and uh, just the uh, <laughs> why I'm so humbled by you all being here. I mean, the imposter syndrome, a guy named Carl Richards, Carl Richards talks about this for financial planners. And uh, it's actually becoming a little bit of a cliche now, which is too bad because I actually think there's a lot of legitimacy to the imposter syndrome thing. I was reading somebody like Elizabeth Warren or something like that talk about the imposter syndrome. And I was like, come on, man. You <laughs> You know, I mean, come on, a business award, but whatever. I mean, everyone has their own imposter syndrome. Anyway, so I was listening, as this guy Carl Bridges talked about it, with people who aren't from money, trying to advise people who have money how to use that money in the most efficient manner. And, uh, and a lot of times we'll say, well, how come they don't know this? Why do I know this? They know this. And thus you'll say, uh, I must not know what I'm talking about or afraid to give advice. And I was like that for the longest time. I'll never forget thinking, you know, I just assumed everyone knew what an index fund was. And I still kind of make that assumption just because this is my world. But I recognize everyone doesn't. And the reason for that is because everyone has their own lives to lead. And not, some people just aren't that interested in the stuff that I'm interested in. And thus, it's it's wonderful for financial advisors to back, just back up a little bit. And to assume uh, the best intentions from the people you're talking about but also not to talk to them like they're stooges, but also not to talk to them like they're rocket scientists either. Just talk to them level, downset. You know, just, I don't get why a lot of the financial advisors feel they have to speak way above here or they're way down here. I just, just talk to people like a human being, man. It's, uh, anyway, our industry is, uh, is chock full of people who, uh, who talk above people's heads as a sort of way to validate how smart they are. But no one, and that's a state planning, planning attorneys, I'm telling you, problem is no one takes action if they don't know what's going on um they won't they would just say that i get it but i don't know man that doesn't make sense so you got to talk to people at a, at a level set so they'll uh be convinced to take action all right so a little bit about me um just in case you're wondering i uh i was born in a small island off the coast of maine in peaks island which is the largest island in the casco bay and uh the best the best memory i have in my life to this day is that uh, there is a preschool on Peaks Island right down the street from where we lived. We lived on Central Ave. 
and uh, I can't, what are you, he's third, three years old, four years old, something like that in preschool. But the best memory I have in my life is my mom picking me up in preschool on a, on a fine uh, day, almost like this here in Georgia, a fine, just a spring day, and walking me home. We just lived, you know, three houses up the street. And uh, man, just like a cobalt blue sky, uh, just this bright, bright yellow sun that just glorified, you know, God's creation. The grass was impeccably dark green, butterflies, you know, dandelions. Oh man, and just we'd go home and, and sit on the back porch and uh, eat uh, vegetable soup. Um, just looking at the, we had the garden, we had chickens, the whole thing back then. And, it, and then you had the, the smell of the ocean breeze coming in. Oh, man, that was the, by far and away my, my most wonderful memory ever. Just a peace and serenity and safety. And then that was it. After that, there was no more of that. There's no more peace, serenity, and safety because uh, my parents... Well, whatever, they just, uh, you know, they, they went their separate ways. Uh, and the years preceding them going their separate ways, it was very, very uh, uh, chaotic, incredibly chaotic, uh, just angry. Um, not good, just not good. And, uh, and so anyway, when, when my folks got divorced, you know, you always hear, oh, do you blame yourself? And I said, hell no, I'm glad they got divorced because I couldn't take it anymore. It's bad. Because some of that stuff would be, uh, they'd turn their guns on me as the oldest kid. And, uh, and that's not good. So anyway, uh, the chaos uh, happened, and then what happens as a uh, as a young boy or younger boy with a younger brother and sister, uh, and, and by then my mom was kind of defeated, which is sad. Um, it's just sad because she's, I mean, such a brilliant, brilliant mind, and I think bipolar actually, uh, and I think bipolar is an issue that we we tend to discount. Um, it's a big deal, man. Uh, bipolar is a big deal, and I wish we'd pay more mind to it. I think a lot of reasons why people get hooked on drugs and alcohol isn't because they're afraid of society. It's because they're bipolar, and it, it challenges them. Where I can't, I don't, I don't know who I'm going to be today, so I'm just going to basically medicate myself so I don't have to deal with it. It's sad. So anyway, so uh, you know, at, my dad moved off the island. It's just my mom, me, my brother, and sister, and she had a bunch of boyfriends come in and whatnot, and it's just it's bad. And I just you know, essentially. I don't think my mom was working. I don't think my dad was paying stupid child support. I mean, look, this is all, I don't know for a fact, but I just know, you know, we didn't have the money to pay. My mom, you know, would let the gas get shut off, the oil. We didn't have the money sometimes. We put the oil in the tank, and so we'd have to go stay at a friend's house and whatnot. And, and so you just get angry as a young man, young boy, and uh, you lash out. You lash out at anybody and everybody. I got so many fights, and I continue to get in fights until my adult, until... Well, I'll just share with you later. And it just says, way to lash out. The minute somebody does something, your first thing is fight back. Your first thing is like, okay, let's go. And even if it doesn't matter, there's no rhyme or reason for it, but your first thing is to fight back. And uh, it's, that's not a good way to live your life, especially as you become an adult, because uh, you could do damage to people and you could really, or yourself. So anyway, uh, but I've always, uh, you know, in that scenario, I've always, always appreciated the underdogs. The uh, the guy hated the bullies, loved the underdogs, always. Always loved the black quarterbacks, you know, Doug Williams, James Harris, uh, Vince Evans used to play for the USC. They went to the Bears because the underdogs. And now I still do. I love the white quarterbacks, for instance. The last one we had was really Jason Seahorn. And then he had uh, Steve Gregory as a white cornerback, but they put him to safety in the Chargers, which, you know, hey, more power to him. But I've always, I've always had an affinity towards the underdogs. And, uh, and that has, you know, it's just, I've always had a, a despisal of, uh, of bullies and uh, those that have given, just haven't had to earn their keep. Now, the question is, the hard part about that is, well, who hasn't earned their keep? Well, I mean, why do I think this guy hasn't earned their keep? It's just prejudice. I don't know. Because we all have, we all have our peccadillos. We all have our fights inside, internal, internal chaos. But yet, for me, it's always been one of those things like, oh, look at him, he's a rich boy, and and I don't know what he's going through. And just because he might have money doesn't necessarily make him uh, easier uh, to to live. I, and that's a, that's a hard thing for me. Always has been a hard challenge, hard struggle for me to to look at somebody with affluence and. Uh, and not getting angry. And I just, I shared this before, but I'll never forget, went to the airport once, I think at six years old, and we didn't have a car. We didn't have a TV for the longest time, but I think, uh, I think we're, my grampy had rented a car or something like that. And he was driving to the airport to, uh, 
to go home to back to California. I, I don't remember the scenario. It just seemed like Grampy was there, and we saw one of these Lincoln Town cars. And back then, they had the the tire was in. Was, they had a little like a lump on the back of the uh, uh, you know the back back paneling, if you will, the the trunk, and it said Continental, and uh, and that was always rich people. And I remember my mom said, "Oh, some along the lines of, oh, what do they do? To, you know, who do they rob or something like that?" And so that was. You know, always my uh, background is that anyone who has uh, wealth uh, got it by ill, <laughs> ill means, and they shouldn't deserve it and whatnot. And like I shared with you before, I mean, my dad had a printing press in the basement, and uh, I rabble rousing for left wing causes. You know, my mom, uh, one of my, they actually literally owned the first, or I don't know if they owned it, but I think they did the first, the first organic. Uh, place up in portland maine they owned it or i know that i forgot what it's called but they owned it they did like before whole foods and all that i mean they were hippies like like you wouldn't believe if you ever saw that forrest gump movie where uh that, i'm sorry where he hits uh, jenny that you know that freaking radical the bill Ayers type he hits jenny and he goes that damn johnson that that's like my dad right there right and then uh for sure temper you know literally a uh, son of a drunken irishman big temper big man and uh, he himself was a drinking guy, as it always is in our family. And uh, and and that was my, my that damn Johnson, you know, allowed, as if it allowed him the right to hit Jenny, if you recall. And anyway, so that was me growing up. And uh, and long story short, just you know, I mean, it was just always fighting, making you know. Was, my mom had food stamps, which I'd steal uh, to go play video games. Uh, yeah, it's just. Look, I'm not trying to give you a pity pat party because I'm in America, man, and I'm telling you, I wouldn't change a thing. I would not change a thing because if I wasn't the way I was raised, I would not be here where I am today. And I love where I am here today. I would not change one thing uh, because of where I am now, which is just, which is wonderful. And that's the thing. You got to fight your bad things. Uh, the, the, the more you suffer, the more glorious the result will be once you succeed, if that makes sense. And that's in hindsight now, or I guess in, in my, as an adult maturing, I suppose, I recognize that the, the, the suffering, and I hate to even say suffering, because I wasn't like a Cambodian, a Cambodian, you know, fighting the Khmer Rouge or something like that. But the suffering for America, nonetheless, um, has allowed me to, to, to understand the grace that I have and the ability to, to just live your life, it's just, it's amazing to me. And, uh, and, I, and I actually feel for people who don't know what that's like, who have no clue what it's like to suffer, because if they don't know what it's like to suffer, they're fearful of maybe not trying to take a risk because they, they're so afraid of what's like. And that's, that's, that's not good either. So I don't have a right answer, like is it better to suffer as a kid or I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know stability is critically important. And you can be poor and stable. In fact, you know, when my wife and I were starting out, we were poor and stable with our kids. I mean, the first two, um, actually, I mean, the, we had four when we were still poor. Uh, we were stable. We didn't have any money. Uh, but the two boys were just ba literally infants and babies. So I, I wouldn't even say uh, we were poor and stable with four kids. But we were certainly poor and stable with two. And then uh, that's a challenge. But the stability of raising your children in a stable, in a safe environment is so critical, man. I'm telling you right now so doggone critical and uh, I just I think men need to recognize that if you're the dad of a, of a young man and uh, I mean that young man needs it because he needs the safety net that you provide that only a man provides your mom you know God bless her but she doesn't provide that same level of safety and security that your dad does and a young man needs that more than anything because because that is they just do boys are different than girls and anyone who disagrees is just being silly and uh, the boy is fighting a different kind of battle than a girl which is why dyslexic girls backtrack into the back of the room and, and remain silent whereas dyslexic boys they lash out that's just the nature of humanity girls versus boys a girl will i'm telling you we there's tons of studies what do girls do when they have dyslexia they sit in the back they never want to be called on what do boys do when they have dyslexia they lash out because they don't want to be made fun of and it's just a different dynamic for boys and girls for sure but either way, I know a young man needs stability in his life. Uh, if he doesn't have it, he's going to come up like I did, which is lash out at everything that moves, that, uh, that's disagreeable. More importantly, though, he's going he's gonna to challenge his own worth. And then what that happens is, and I told you about this the other day, uh, in the Adult Children of Alcoholics book, uh, he, does, he doesn't value himself. And so because he doesn't value himself, anyone who values him 
he will not value them. It's actually incredibly amazing when you think about it. I'm a bad person. For you to love me means you have to be a bad person. Thus, I can't love you because I don't want to love a bad person. Does that make sense? It's an incredible dynamic, actually. And, uh, and I, I mean, I was like that growing up. I can't tell you how many girlfriends I had that just I was mean to when I, when I recognized that they actually, you know, maybe not love me, but, but valued me. Simply because I said, how can you value me? I'm not worth your value. And if you do value me, you must be worse than me. And thus, I'm going to be mean to you to drive you away from me before you, uh, before you leave me. It's just this always this constant battle, man. And uh, it's, I tell you, I, but it makes sense. You're like, why would, why would I value somebody who values me because I don't value myself? Which is the whole point about you know being able to forgive yourself. Because if you can't forgive yourself, you're violating God's commandments. God says, I forgive. I forgive all who ask for it. Well, God, I want you to forgive everybody else, but you can't forgive me because I've done too much evil. God doesn't say that. He doesn't say, yeah, everybody I forgive except for Josh. No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. God forgives all. All. And so when you're grown up and you, and you have this mentality of, of, of not having any worth, of self-worth, it makes you lash out, and particularly at the people who love you most. It's sad. So the thing I recommend is you got to get that self-worth, and not by a stupid self-esteem thing in PC culture in America today. It's a self-worth that I find comes from the knowing that Jesus died for you. He died for me. He died for you. He died for that guy drive that pickup truck. He died for all. And when you, when you start to put two and two together, you say, oh, Jesus values me so much that he would take the freaking nails and the pain and the suffering so that I could attain heaven. God values me so much that he sent his son to die on the cross because of how much he loves you. I, I mean, can you imagine? I got two boys. And I'm going to say, this guy right there driving that Porsche on Highway 400 going towards Atlanta. I love you so much. I will sacrifice one of my children to prove it. And not only that, but that children will just say, Liam. Liam will gladly. Now, Jesus has some. At the last minute, he was like, why? Why? But he will gladly take the pain to show my love for that guy. Even though I don't know him. He doesn't know him. But he does. He does. Jesus does. He knows all. And he wants a personal relationship with each and every one of us. Now, it's a battle I fight all the time. And I tell you, I still get angry. I don't drink. I haven't drank since uh, May 25th, 1997. Who's counting, right? Because I know drinking is the thing that the devil does to get me to change my uh, composure, for sure. I love drinking, man. I love beer. I never laid hard alcohol, thank God. But, man, I could drink some freaking IPAs like what well, you would believe. I love them. Some Sierra Nevada. Oh, some Guinness. Oh, man. Some IPAs, I could knock those suckers down. I managed a bar for two years. You know, I was a bartender for two years, maybe two and a half, actually. And I, man, I tell you, I could drink like the best of them. No good ever happened to me when I did that, though, that's for sure. Only but for the grace of God did I not have a DWI. But anyway, so uh, when, when we had our second child, you know, so I went in the Army because I was such a clown in school. I hated school. I've always liked the Mark Twain uh, saying. I, I guess it's attributed to him, and presumably it's true. Don't let schooling get in the way of your learning. I've always hated school. Just sitting still while these cocky people are like, I got a 92, what'd you? I said, man, I don't even, like, I could care less. We're just regurgitating stuff. It doesn't matter. Uh, and that's still the same way it is today. It's even worse now because now there's no independent thought allowed in the school system. Uh, but anyway, so I uh, I went in the Army. That was that was wonderful for me, you know, and I got to see some places that were real poor. Now I said to myself, I, I thought I was poor. Hell, this ain't nothing compared to what these guys are uh, living like in most of the world. I mean, we are lucky to be alive. And that changed my mentality for sure about my mindset of being a left-wing, rabble-rouser, anti-American, 
to realize in America is the land of bounty. But it's not the land of bounty because our resources or our people. It's the land of bounty because of our freedom. It's not diversity. Diversity doesn't make us better. It's our freedom makes us better. Diversity is not a bad thing inherently, but it's not necessarily a good thing either. It just is. It's, I mean, I'm just telling you, diversity is nothing. It's our freedom that allows diverse people to succeed, which in that case, people will put the cart before the horse and say, a diverse people succeeds, does it's diversity which allows for success. No, 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 no. It's freedom that allows people to succeed of all walks of life. And in America, anyone can succeed from all walks of life even those who have made huge mistakes in the past. And that's just factual, man. The proof is through, the proof is, there's so much evidence it's not even debatable. And I just look at Ben Carson, for example. Look at that guy, surgeon. I mean, just nuts. Anyway, so uh, when we had our second child, it was probably the most important thing that ever happened to me, frankly, is that uh, Chloe was born with a vent ventricular tachycardia, uh, which is a very, very rare uh, heart condition that's on the bottom of her heart and so her heartbeat was going like a, a double bass drum for a, a speed metal band and it never stopped and it did not and the doctor you can see i never forget the doctor saying uh you can see the like <laughs> pale face he's like we don't know what to do he didn't say that but you could just see it's like he saw a ghost he had no clue what this was so ventricular tachycardia is so um what's the word i'm looking for uh foreign like or a uh, uncommon, whatever the word is, uh, anyway, rare, I guess. And that, so anyway, we had to take her down to the University of Virginia, a NICU unit. And that's where Chloe stayed for the first three months, or the first three weeks of her life, four weeks, something like that. But anyway, so uh, uh, my wife was down there with her. My wife was just giving birth, and she was going into, uh, uh, you know, they were wanting her to stay at the hospital for a day that, that where she had Chloe, which was Harrisonburg. And I had my other daughter, I had to come police up from a friend's house to take home. And I, uh, and so long story short, I, I went, but this is on 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. And I went back, uh, my wife said, hey, just call UVA, you know, make sure Chloe's doing okay. And I can't remember if we even had a name for her at that point. So anyway, it was about 11 o'clock and I had an exhausting day, obviously. You don't know what's going on with your daughter. Um, your other daughter's like, hey, what the hell? Where's Chloe? Uh, you know, because she wanted to see her and be able to you know, t touch, you know, just hug and snuggle her little sis. And I, well, anyway, uh, it was about 11 o'clock at night, and I finally got home, put Maddie to bed, and then I called down to UVA Hospital, and a lady named Joanna, or Joanne, uh, I forgot, but I'll, I, I remember it's Joanne or Joanna, and, uh, and I, you know, I don't even think we had a name for Chloe at that point, we just had a, uh, like a, uh, a count number, essentially, and uh, I called down there, and, and Joanna was, uh, was quite rude to me, actually, because Nicky, I said, uh, hey, uh, my name is Josh Scanlon. My daughter just got sent there from Harrisonburg. She goes, account number. I said, uh, I don't know. I, I wasn't given an account number. She literally just got sent there. She goes, well, I don't have anything for you. I have to call back tomorrow. We get an account number. And uh, and she was, I, I'll never. And she hung up. But I was, I was so taken aback, my friends, that I, man, I was, I was stunned, literally stunned into silence. I, I said, uh, okay. And I hung up the phone. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I got on my hands and knees and started bawling like a big old baby. Start crying. Like, I never felt so helpless in my life. My wife is over here in the hospital. My daughter is with people, at, presumably at the University of Virginia, that are taking care of her. But when I called to get the update on that, they basically... Well, not basically. They literally said, we don't have anything on her until you get the account number. We haven't even got an account number for her yet. Call back tomorrow. I was like, I mean, do I even know she's there? Is mean, she alive? I mean, what? Is my wife alive? Because when she has C-section, they, they cut you up pretty good. Lots of blood. And I got my hands and knees, my friends, and I was bawling like a big, fat baby. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this incredible feeling of peace and serenity came over me. And the words were put into my head, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Now again, it wasn't like, you know, the Simpsons where the God comes from the clouds and says, Homer! It wasn't like that. But it was so clear to me, it's going to be okay. It was so peaceful to me I know that's the Holy Spirit. And uh, 
man. <laughs> uh, what a wondrous feeling. And I don't know what God was saying, the Holy Spirit. Like, is it going to be okay that Chloe's going to lie and be alive? I don't know. At that point, I didn't care. Because I knew that whatever happened, Chloe was in good hands and was going to make it out. Regardless of that meant she didn't survive. Regardless of that meant she did survive. I don't know what it was going to be. But I can't tell you how clear that was to me. I had some lady, and she was telling me it wasn't God. It was just your mental defense up in your head. And, and, okay. I, mean, I just, I don't, all right, that's fine. I can't prove it's God. I can't prove it's the Holy Spirit. But you can't prove it's a mental defense either. I, I don't get why the the first, I'll never forget this, the first uh, defendant, I, it's just weird. Like, why? I mean, I, I don't get it. Okay, well, that's just your, your brain telling you a defensive mechanism. I said, well, you don't know that any more than I know for sure it's the Holy Spirit. I mean, but my whole thing is why? Why is it so foreign to people to say there is a supernatural? I don't get it. Anyway, so I've talked to many people over the, the years, and I, I cannot tell you how many people told me they've had same similar you know, things. Like bad, and they weren't Christians necessarily, or maybe Christians in name only, but certainly weren't practicing necessarily. But then all of a sudden out of nowhere, they had this feeling of complete serenity. And yeah, I mean, look, because we're in America, and you know, we're born to, in a Christian environment, we attribute that to, uh, to Christianity. You know, maybe it'd be the same if we're born in India. We attribute it to uh, what I don't even know what Buddhism, I guess. I don't know, but I do know that hearing that story time and time and time again and time again from people who have no reason. I just why would I mean people lie? I get it, but <laughs> it's just it's nuts. Hearing from guys that are you know, I go to AA, these drunkards out there. Who were, if you ever seen that Chris Foley thing, I was just showing my kids actually today, you know, living by in a van down by the river from Saturday Night Live. And you'd hear these just drunken losers. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they just get pulled up by a voice that says, let's get back, let's change. And they do. And now they're, you know, successful. That doesn't mean they're necessarily successful businessmen or anything, but. You know, they're, they're, they're managing their lives. And yet they were at the deepest depths of despair, being, being addicted to smack or just drugs and alcohol or alcohol or whatever it is. I mean, how do you, I don't know how you, what you attribute that to other than divine intervention. And I'd call the Holy Spirit. Now, it might be whatever your religious capacity is. I, I don't know. I'm not God. I can't answer questions on why God chose me, essentially, to give me the Holy Spirit. And maybe didn't choose you. I don't know. But I do know one thing. Devil likes the noise. All right? The devil loves the noise. And so when you don't have silence in the background, man, it is so much harder to hear God speaking to you. The devil loves the noise. If you just read the screw tape letters where they talk about hell, you know, you think it's hell is like pits of fire and all that. And torment of pits of fire is, I thought, it's a very interesting where a screw tape, or a, I think a screw tape, where he's proposing a toast to the other devils saying hell isn't like that at all hell is just noise utter chaotic noise that never stops because it never allows your mind to rest and think and yet that's what we do to ourselves we create this noise all the time we can't think it's just noise and noise and noise and god's like banging on the door like let me in let me in and god gives you free reign he says you don't have to let me in but i'm here all you got to do is be quiet for a second. Let him talk to you. And yet we don't. We always have to have music. Always have a distraction. Because to, to actually use our mind might lead to bad thinking. I guess. I don't know. But that's sad. And that is uh, that is what that told me. Is the peace and serenity of just quiet. And it's actually interesting. I interviewed her, uh, Jane Brox, uh, from my YouTube my podcast. And she had written the book, uh, uh, Light, uh, Brilliant, about lighting. You know, literally lighting and the history of lighting it throughout the world that I thought was interesting and she got a new book that she just published a couple months ago called Silence and I haven't uh, read it yet but I'm very much looking forward to it because I do think silence is uh, is God's way to speak to you to say hey just shut up <laughs> so I can talk to you and uh, and if we don't have silence we're going into the God uh, going into the devil's trap for sure lastly let me suggest another C.S. Lewis book uh, The Great Divorce uh, because we're always fighting battles. Even Christians fight battles all the time. I mean, Christians, the, the, 
The devil wants more than anything to take uh, stout Christians and turn them. Uh, that that's a not, that's a twofer for the devil. So to take a guy who's just you know I don't know some communist guy who's just living for the day and doesn't believe in anything that's easy for the devil. He's like yeah I mean I got there's no <laughs> there's no challenge there. The challenge is some guy who believes. I'm gonna I'm gonna tempt that guy who believes with all the weapons of war. And because that guy uh, presumably doesn't have any silence, he, he's leaving his biggest defense mechanism, God. Uh, he, he's, he's leaving at the back of the battlefield. So he's not even he's not even fully armed, which is stupid. But anyway, so C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Great Divorce, he talks about, uh, this is incredibly interesting. It's, uh, you, you, there's a guy whose wife died, and I haven't read this book for a number of years, so I'm, I'm probably butchering the scenario, but basically what happens is you get on a bus and you go to heaven. And this guy, uh, his wife has died, and it looks like, I think